Hi, Mike Aben here with a KSP tutorial. Bill has gotten himself into a bit of a pickle. He's up here in orbit with a command pod, but with no means of propulsion, and he is in need of a rescue. So we'll get Bill back into the command pod and set about taking what we've learned over the past few episodes and design a vehicle capable of getting to Bill and getting him back home. We'll start off with the Mark-2 command pod, make sure there's an empty seat available, and set about building an orbiter. In the last episode, we learned how to calculate the delta V for a Hohmann transfer. So let's figure out the delta V requirements for this mission. At each stage, I will round up to the nearest 10 meters per second. Now, Bill is in a 150 kilometer orbit. We'll launch into an 80 kilometer orbit and then transfer up to Bill's orbit. The first burn will cost about 60 meters per second, and the burn to circularize at 150 kilometers will also be about 60 meters per second. Once we've rescued Bill, we'll need to get back down, and this will require another burn to bring our periapsis into the atmosphere. The transfer burn from 150 kilometers to 30 kilometers is about 100 meters per second. This adds up to a total delta V requirement of 220 meters per second. In the second part of this episode, I'll go over how to calculate the delta V available in any stage of a vehicle. One of the pieces of information we will need is a number called the specific impulse or ISP of our engine. The ISP is a measure of the efficiency of the engine. I'm going with the LV909 Terrier engine, and under the information tab we can see two specific impulses, 85 ASL and 345 VAC. The first is on curb and surface, while the second is in the vacuum of space. As you can see, this would be a poor choice for an engine in an atmosphere, but it is a fantastic little orbital engine. We will also need the total mass of the vehicle, which turns out to be 7.65 tons. In the first episode, we learned how to calculate thrust to weight ratio, and with the 60 kilonewtons of thrust from the Terrier engine, we get a TWR of 0.8. This is plenty for orbital maneuvering. The final number we need is the mass of the vehicle with all its fuel gone, often called the dry mass. This is 6.85 tons. This gives us 374 meters per second of available delta V, 154 meters per second more than our budget, so we should have no troubles at all having enough fuel. All right, so let's build the booster that will get this thing into orbit. I want to make calculating delta V the main focus of this video, but there are a few things I should mention when it comes to rocket design. The first is rigidity. This transition from the 1.25 meter engine to the 2.5 meter fairing base looks like it might be flimsy to me. So I'm shoring it up with a few struts. Struts are great for shoring up flimsy connections and they will disappear when the decoupler is staged. The second is attitude control. There are three mechanisms for attitude control on this rocket. The control surfaces on the tail fins, the gimbling in the main engine, and the reaction wheels in the cockpit. The gimbling only does anything while under thrust, and the tail fins will become useless once the atmosphere thins out. The reaction wheels in the command pod may not be enough for the entire rocket, so I'm adding another set of reaction wheels to the booster. Position reaction wheels as close as you can to the center of mass of the vehicle. You can toggle on and off the center of mass indicator using the buttons at the bottom left of the screen. The final thing I'll mention before getting to delta V is aerodynamics. First, keep your rocket rather tall and thin, like a real rocket, though this may come at the expense of rigidity, so you'll have to balance off the two. Second, the control fins at the bottom will bring the center of lift down towards the back of the rocket. You'll want to have the center of lift well behind the center of mass of your rocket, as this will improve its stability during ascent. It's important to realize that the center of mass will move downwards as the rocket drains fuel. If you find your rocket flipping around backwards during ascent, it is almost always because the center of mass has moved behind the center of lift. Adding more or bigger tail fins should rectify this. Again, the center of mass and center of lift indicators can be toggled on and off using the buttons at the bottom left of the screen. Now, Calculating delta V requirements for achieving a low curb in orbit is a bit more complicated than for a Hohmann transfer, so I'll refer to a delta V map for this. This particular map is from the KSP wiki, and it's telling me that the cost is going to be 3400 meters per second. 
Although the Terrier is a bit of an extreme example, all rocket engines will have lower ISPs in an atmosphere than they do in a vacuum. There are always ways to work this into your delta V calculations, but frankly, I don't bother. Instead, I just budget around 3,550 to about 3,600 meters per second to get to orbit, the extra making up for the loss of efficiency while in the atmosphere. You may also have noticed that I like to keep my vehicles on the small side. There's nothing wrong with monster rockets, but keep in mind that for every ton of payload, expect your final vehicle to mass about 10 times that. There are definite advantages to keeping your payloads as small as you can, especially in career mode. Now on the right, I'm keeping track of the specific impulse, total mass, and dry mass as I make changes to the booster. I'm also keeping a running calculation going on the available Delta V. This is not as much of a pain as it sounds if you have a spreadsheet program running alongside your game, though it sure would be nice if KSB would do this for us and provide the information in the engineering tab. Of course, there are mods that will do this for you, my personal favorite being Kerbal Engineer Redux. But I want to keep this tutorial build completely stock. Our final product ended up with a booster with 3,620 meters per second of available delta V, and a launch thrust to weight ratio of 1.45, which maxed out at 5.19 as the fuel ran out. This ought to do it. We'll launch this thing in the next episode and talk about how to go about rendezvousing with an object in space. Okay, how to calculate delta V in a vessel. I'm going to do this in three parts. The first part is going to present the formula and show you how to use it. Part two will derive the formula, but we'll skip over the calculus that is required. Finally, in part three, I'll delve a bit into the calculus behind the derivation. You are free to bail out at any point in this process. The formula we're interested in is usually referred to as Sikorsky's rocket equation, or simply the rocket equation. Konstantin Sikorsky, along with German Herm Hermann Oberth and American Robert Goddard, is considered one of the founding fathers of rocketry and independently derived this equation in 1897. As a point of fact, this equation was already worked out by the British William Moore in 1813. The m0 in the formula represents the initial mass of the vehicle, while the mf is the final mass after the burn. The ve is the velocity of the escaping exhaust relative to the ship. The ln is a function called the natural logarithm. I'll put a link in the description for those who are unfamiliar with logarithms. However, this form of the equation is not what's useful for use in KSP. That's because KSP doesn't give us the VE for their rocket engines, but instead gives us the engine's specific impulse. Thankfully, the two values are directly related to each other. The specific impulse, or ISP, is just VE divided by the standard gravitational constant G0, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Knowing that the velocity is measured in meters per second and the G0 is measured in meters per second squared and doing the dividing explains why ISP is measured in seconds. Anyway, a little rearranging gets VE equals ISP times G0, and substituting gets us this more useful form of the rocket equation. Let's work out the delta V for my orbiter from the video. Looking back, the M0 was 7.65 tons, MF 6.85 tons, and the specific impulse of the engine was 345 seconds. Notice that, as we are dividing the masses in the formula, it doesn't matter what units they are measured in. Putting the numbers into the formula and pushing them through a calculator gets 373 meters per second for the vessel's available delta V. And that's it! With the rocket equation, you can work out the available delta V for any stage of your rocket. All you need are the starting and finishing masses and the ISP of your engine. If you happen to have multiple engines going with different ISPs, there is a formula for calculating their combined ISP, but I'm going to leave that for another time. That's because right now I want to show where the rocket equation comes from. We're going to derive the first version of the rocket equation. You may recall from the last video that the formula for calculating the delta V of a Hohmann transfer is based upon the principle of conservation of energy. This derivation is also based upon another fundamental idea from physics, conservation of linear momentum. Here we have a ship of mass m0 that is about to eject a mass delta m. As velocity is relative, it doesn't matter what the initial velocity of the ship is. 
and we can effectively consider its velocity to be zero. The ejected mass will leave with a velocity VE relative to the ship. Of course, the mass of the ship has now decreased by delta M. In addition, as per Newton's third law, a reaction force will have propelled the ship in the opposite direction. The ship's velocity will have changed by an amount delta V. We will now consider the linear momentum of each object. Momentum is calculated by taking the mass and multiplying it by the velocity. So the momentum of our ship will be m0 minus delta m times delta v. Similarly, the momentum of the ejected mass would be delta m times ve. And, as our initial velocity was effectively zero, these two quantities must add to zero in order for total momentum to be conserved. We'll rearrange this by taking the momentum of the ejected mass over to the other side. And then we'll simplify further by recognizing that m0 minus delta m is just our final mass. It would be really tempting here to just rearrange for the delta v, but that yields us an incorrect formula. We have to be careful. The issue is that the mass transfer does not happen instantaneously. The mass changes as a function of time as we burn fuel. We have to factor that in, and for that we need calculus. Let's get the time interval involved by dividing both sides of the equation by delta t. I'll then divide the mf over to the other side, as it's the delta v over delta t that I really want to concentrate on. You may notice that I did some reshuffling of the terms on the right side of the equal sign. Why I did this will become apparent in a moment. Let's carry our formula over to the next slide. We need to get rid of the delta t's, and to do that, we integrate with respect to t. For those that have not taken any first year calculus, which is likely most of you, I do apologize. In the next part of the video, I will try to demystify these squiggly symbols a bit, but for now, I'm just going to blow on ahead. We'll assume VE is constant. It very well may not be, especially if you are traveling through the atmosphere, yes, even in KSB. But in the vacuum of space, this is an acceptable approximation to make. This means we can remove it from the interval, along with the negative sign. Now, if we let the time interval be very small, the delta t's and dt will come towards the same value and will divide out. On the left side, this leaves us with delta v, which is what we want. On the right side, we need to do some integrating, and after doing so, we're left with the negative log of m0 divided by m final. There was a bit of hand-waving in that last step, but I'll get to that in the next part of the video. What's left is simply to cancel out the two negatives, leaving us with our rocket equation. Okay, if you're anything like me, you wouldn't have been too impressed with the hand-waving back there. Specifically, how does this integral become the negative of the natural logarithm of the initial mass divided by the final mass? For that matter, what the heck is an integral? An integral can be defined in a number of ways, but for our purposes, I'm going to define it as an antiderivative. Now I need to define a derivative, but thankfully that's easier than an integral. A derivative is simply the rate at which something is changing. Motion at a constant velocity is likely the simplest example to use. Let's say I'm moving at a constant velocity, and over a time interval of 10 seconds, my position changes by 50 meters. My velocity would be 50 divided by 10, or 5 meters per second. Now, velocity is the rate at which position changes. So I could also say that the derivative with respect to time of my position function is 5 meters per second. This gets more fun if the rate of change is not constant, but I think this gives you the idea. Just remember that a derivative is just the rate at which a function is changing. In saying that an integral is an antiderivative, I mean that the derivative of the result of an integration will get what was initially inside the interval. That is, I need to show that the derivative with respect to time of negative log of m0 over mf will get what was originally inside the integral, namely delta m over mf times 1 over delta t. Rearrange slightly, 1 over mf times delta m over delta t. To take derivatives, we need some rules. These are common rules from any introductory calculus course, so some of you have undoubtedly seen them before. If not, well, you can Google them. The first rule is that the derivative of the natural logarithm of x is 1 over x. Again, remember that derivatives calculate the rate of change. So if I had an equation with the log of something in it, and I wanted to know the rate at which that equation is changing at a particular value, I would just calculate 1 divided by that value. 
Rule 2 is commonly referred to as the power rule and tells us how to take derivatives of powers. Finally, our equation is not in terms of time, but instead in terms of mass, which in turn varies with time. To deal with this, we have what is usually referred to as the chain rule. This says that you can take the derivative with respect to the variable in the equation as long as you then multiply by the derivative of that variable with respect to the variable you want. What I like about the chain rule is that, if you look at it closely, it almost proves itself. All right, let's do it. By our log rule, if we take the derivative of a log, we just get the reciprocal of what's inside the log. However, by the chain rule, we need to then multiply by the derivative of what is in the logarithm with respect to t. I'm going to take what's inside the derivative on the right side and write it slightly differently so that I can use the power rule. Let's take this over to the next slide and apply the power rule, treating the m0 as a constant. This brings the exponent of the negative down to the front and reduces the exponent by 1, getting negative 2. Again, by the chain rule, we still have to multiply by the derivative of mf with respect to t. Combining the terms ahead of the derivative simply gets 1 over mf, and I reorganize the derivative into dmf by dt. But what is the value of dmf by dt? Remember that the derivatives measure the rate of change of something. If we assume the rate of change of mass is a constant, then mf will be the amount of mass loss, delta m, divided by the time interval, delta t, which, if you look back, is exactly what I needed the derivative to come out to be. Wow, four episodes in and I've already got some major calculus going on. But the rocket equation is a formula we will be using a lot, so I think it is worth it. Next episode, we'll be rescuing Bill, which means we need to talk about rendezvous. Thankfully, we now have all the math we need to pull off the mission. I hope to see you then.